Today, the mass surveillance of all Americans by the U.S. government and its corporate partners is a totally normalized reality. Despite its widespread acceptance, it is an outrageous, blatant violation of our constitutional rights. It's difficult to ascertain how the chilling effect of dragnet spying has changed society in the post-9-11 world. However, many insiders in the intelligence community understood the dangers of these programs from the beginning. Edward Snowden is celebrated as a hero for bringing proof of NSA's mass spying and bulk collection to the world. But years prior, Bill Binney had blown the whistle on this very same program. A 36-year veteran at the NSA, Bill Binney was the technical director, responsible for developing and overseeing the agency's spying technology. He even developed ThinThread, the data monitoring program that was later hijacked by the Bush administration to implement widespread warrantless surveillance. Mounting pressure caused Obama to pass the Freedom Act in 2015, which only outsourced its bulk acquisition to telecom companies, using the secret of FISA court as an intermediary. And nearly 20 years after 9-11, these unaccountable agencies are using new fears, like of Russian cyber warfare, to grow their power and operations. I caught up with Binney in Vancouver at the University of British Columbia, where he received the Allard Prize for International Integrity to talk to him about blowing the whistle and the fight against the surveillance state today. So you were the technical director at the NSA for many, many years. Talk about what you were trying to do with the creation of ThinThread. Uh, it was basically to try to solve technical problems that the analysts were having. There were about 6,000 analysts involved in analyzing all the data from all the countries of the world. So, uh, so the biggest problem I saw was the, the uh, basically ballooning information from the digital world. So the, the point was there was too much data, even back then in the 90s, when they couldn't, when it wasn't anywhere near the capacity they have now to collect data. So even then they were buried. I mean, they could tend to 20 or 30,000 items every day from the day's take. They'd start through them. If they ran into something they had to report, they'd go report it and stop. Then at the end of the day, they'd leave and all the rest of it wasn't looked at. So then the next day came in, the same, another 20,000 or so items came down on them to look at. So they started the same process again. So even internally in NSA, they were saying, we are overburdened by overload. I said, well, if you, looked at, if, you, if you look at the data itself, you're doomed because it's just too much of it. So the metadata was the key to be able to pull out what was relevant and let the rest of it simply go by and don't let your analysts uh, look at it, just don't take it in. And the haystack just keeps getting bigger, yeah, Bill. Yeah, right. I right. mean, give us a sense of how much data we're talking about in 2019. Uh, probably, uh, uh, probably a couple petabytes a day, uh, which is like a million terabytes. Wow. I mean, several billion messages, right? Uh, actually, Every... I think they're getting all the emails. So uh, the estimate was about 90 billion a day from emails alone. I mean, uh, we had like 12, I estimated 12 billion phone calls a day, uh, 3 billion in the U.S. alone. All of that, uh, and by the way, I did have evidence of them uh, using uh, transcript transcription algorithms to transcribe the phone calls, which meant they could do millions and millions and millions of them. Uh, and then they use algorithms to go through the transcripts. Oh, so, wow, so they're actually doing transcriptions. Transcription, yeah. And, they, and, then, and then they refer it to humans to transcribe. They have like 2,000, they've had since 2002 and three, about 2,000 transcribers at Fort Gordon, Georgia that they refer them to. All these calls are indexed by number and they can call up any number and, and then listen to it. Thin Thread was in direct competition to Trailblazer, of course, the program that former NSA director Michael Hayden was shopping around to private intelligence firms why did they go with this program, Bill, considering the encryption that was available within ThinThread and the fact that it was far cheaper? The basic things they removed from ThinThread before they used it to create Stellar Wind, uh, the selection, the filtering up front, we were selecting based on the deductive, inductive, and abductive criteria for, for looking at people either as known or suspected terrorists or criminals of any sort, dope smuggling, all of that. So. Uh, the, the filtering then just let everything else go by. That's not what Cheney wanted. Cheney wanted everything. That way he had knowledge about everybody. So that filtering was removed. So everything came in. And then, and then beyond that, if we pulled you in and uh, you weren't known to be a terrorist and they didn't have a warrant on you, we encrypted your attributes so that nobody could tell who you were, even inside NSA. 
So the FBI couldn't come into the NSA database to randomly search for crimes by known persons because it wasn't, it wasn't equivalent, you know, it was an encrypted version. So we were protecting the identities even at that point. But the final one was a real kicker for them. Um, that was the one that uh, basically analyzed the lo network log. And uh, it, when we said that we would monitor all this and, and keep track of all of it and show return on investment and all that, management at NSA said, you mean Congress could come in and see all this and uh, know what we're doing? And we said, sure, they could do that. Their answer was, you are never going to do this. So we did it secretly in the lab and incorporated it into the back end of ThinThread. And uh, that was another thing they got rid of because they didn't want anybody to know what they were doing. So getting rid of the filtering, they took in everything. Getting rid of the encryption meant they knew who everybody was. And getting rid of the auditing program meant that no one could find out what they're doing. And this was a fire sale kind of opening up to private intelligence firms to capitalize on Trailblazer, not ThinThread, because it was far more yeah. expensive. What was the incentive, though? Because this was before the fire sale that opened up after 9-11. The CEO of Quest, Joe Naccio, was approached in late February of 2001, about six months before, seven months before 9-11, to turn over all the data on all his customers. And the person who did, they, they were from NSA, they came in from NSA to do that. So this is like uh, the, the intent is there to collect data on US citizens and everybody and bulk acquisition was their motive. And the reason was because in order to do that, it's gonna cost an arm and a leg. How many other companies are we talking about here and how much money are we talking about here? Uh, well, my estimate of the budget for NSA is like uh, run around $15 billion a, day, a year. And that, that means about 70% of that goes to the companies for contracts. Wow, so we're talking about 75% or so that's outsourced. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And I think it's even grown, the outsourcing has grown even further since I left. I'm sure it has. Yeah. And Watch Dogs Didn't Bark, uh, immediately after 9-11, um, it tells this story about you and your colleague. Your colleague was told by higher-ups at the NSA to not mm. embarrass large companies uh, affiliated yeah. with the intelligence mm. failure, and that if you do your part, you'll earn Get your share. share. Right. And uh, mm. saying that they could milk the cow for 15 years. Now, yes. Bill, this seems like a very odd thing to say in the immediate wake of the most devastating terrorist attack on U.S. soil. Well, you see, the focus is on getting money, and that's the reason they say those kinds of things. It's not to, it's not to fix the problem. The, the point is to keep the problem going so they keep asking for more money. There wasn't a moment of reckoning? Not among, not among green, greedy people, no. And that include the management of NSA. I mean, what was your response to this when you were in the I halls? I mean, my response is testimony in their various places that they traded the security of the people of the United States and the free world for money. I mean, they still have the same problem. They haven't changed a thing. So what, what it means to everybody in the world is people keep dying from these attacks that they could stop. I mean, look at every attack that's happened. Yep, every one is, is basically done by people who are already known to be bad. Well, I mean, the issue is why aren't you focusing on them and reduce your problem and get rid of all the other people in the world? Paint the scenario that you're talking about, about preventing terrorism with the 9-11 attacks. I mean, you, you talk about how Thin Thread could have prevented this. You were looking yep. at these centers in late December 2000. Right, before 9-11, yeah. So elaborate on that. That's why I came up with the uh, vision statement for all these companies working for NSA. They all fail to some degree on every program that's so they can keep it going. So my, 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 originally I thought the, their, their vision statement was aim low and miss because they failed at everything. But it really is keep the problem going so the money keeps flowing. Well, I mean, let's talk just about one center, the Yemen facility that the hijackers were yep. communicating with. This was a heavily monitored facility from the NSA. Yep. What went wrong there? Again, you know, I can't really explain it. I mean, all that data was in the NSA data as it happened. So, and this is what Alexander says, we could not tell who it was in the US. That's false. That's in the data that the analyst gets to see. That's minimization process occurs when he pulls the data. The real data is all in the collection database. And that data was there. And it was the people in uh, San Diego. And one of them was a perpetrator of the USS Cole bombing. Yeah. I mean... And in fact, we knew those people before they, you know, uh, I mean, we knew the entire Al-Qaeda network worldwide from about 1970, 1996 on. So I, you know, I mean, I, 
if NSA didn't want to publish anything that I thought was important to get to people in any agency, I used what was called the gray phone, you know, it's the encrypted line. I would just call somebody I knew and just tell them, this is happening, you know? So I would go around it. Why did no one do that? See, that's the, that's the real problem. That's why a lot of people at NSA were really depressed after it because they, they knew that uh, what they did not do contributed to the failure. At the working level, you know, they, I, they couldn't understand management not wanting to report things, you know. And, and at that point, Bill, I mean, after 9-11, of course, you and your colleagues uh, had to make a choice. You had to make a choice to protect the Constitution against the government that you were serving for decades. Yeah. Uh, talk about what you did. I mean, you went to your management and you, you described the scenario. You ended up resigning in disgust. When, when I first learned about the spying on everybody in the country, U.S. country and in Canada, and, and uh, then spreading to the world, uh, when I first learned about that was the second week in uh, October of 2001. That's when we saw all this equipment coming in and they were moving it down the hall. To, so when they were setting it up and then uh, starting to take in data, it was about the second week in October. See, they had to use our software to do it because they couldn't manage large-scale data inputs. So we had the only program that worked. So that's... They still needed you. Yeah, that's wrong. <laughs> but they didn't want me to know because they knew right. I would never put up with this. You know, this is not something I would be quiet about. So, I mean, um, and I wasn't alone. Most of the people in the leadership in SARC were, were straight-laced people. You, you obey the Constitution, you follow the laws, all of that, you know. And so they did this down the hall from us separately, and they were building it up. And then they started using our contractors to set up the software, take the inputs, and started running. And then when he did that, uh, one of the contractors came to me, came to me and said, you know what they're doing down there? So they're taking in all the data on U.S. citizens. Everything that AT&T has, they're taking in. All the transmissions and, co and calls and uh, to, from, you know, duration, date, time, all that. So... All that was being taken in, um, and that's a direct violation of the Fourth and you know First Amendments, the Constitution. So, what happened when you guys resigned? Why did you make well, that final decision? Well, uh, three of us, uh, Ed Loomis, uh, Kirk Weeby, and I, were already eligible for retirement. So we retired real quickly. You know, of course, I, I directly I went directly to the to Diane Rourke on the House Intelligence Committee. So she managed all the write-ups of all the money requests for NSA and all the programs and everything. So I went to her and I said, you know, what they're doing here is, uh, you know, taking in all this data. And she said, that's obviously, a, you know, a, a violation of the Constitution. And, you know, my assumption was very simple. Hayden would never have done that unless he had uh, approval from higher up, meaning the White House. It made sense to me at the time that uh, Cheney, being the vice president, uh, was uh, directing this. And with the approval of Bush. And Bush said, Cheney, you take over. Yeah, but the problem is he took a lot of people with him, and now they're, he took a lot of countries with him now. So they're all doing this, and it's all fundamentally violating their uh, constitutional human rights issues. We've gone so far with the yeah. bulk acquisition, it seems impossible to start to roll it back. Actually, that's not true. Yeah? You unfund them. When you cut their budget, they can't do it. Yeah, but isn't there kind of an intelligence security complex that's, you know, you can argue is just kind of operating on its own? I call it the uh, Praetorian Guard. You know, those who want to uh, manage who is president or leader and, who, uh, and what they do. They can control what they do by simply modifying, selecting only certain information and making it available to them. You know, it kind of gives them the ideas. What, what, will, what would give the president the idea of doing this? Mm -hmm. So you select the data that would inf influence him in making the decision to do that. In 2007, Bill, the FBI raided your home alongside colleague Kurt Wiebe. What was that experience like for you guys, and were you surprised by the aggressiveness of the response? Yeah, well, you know, I was in the shower at the time, and they broke in and pushed my son out of, out of the way out, at gunpoint. Came up and pointed guns at my wife, and came in the shower and pointed guns at me. And I sat there, and I said, you know, what, what, why am I a threat, you know? <laughs> So the uh, point was, uh, and I'm pretty sure that uh, Attorney General Gonzalez sent them there to keep us quiet because he had just testified to the Senate Judiciary Committee about the president's terrorist surveillance program where he only talked about the, uh, the uh, tapping of phones when someone in the U.S. is talking to a foreigner. Now, that was the part they talked about. They didn't talk about any of the rest of it, which was total bulk acquisition of everything that every U.S. citizen does 
on the internet, on the phone network, and on and, and financial transactions, anything in financial transactions, credit card use, everything. So all of that they didn't talk about, and they were afraid. They knew we had experience of going to committees in the Congress. They didn't want that to happen, and so Gonzalez said, you better hit them now, and so they did. So, you so know, they were desperate. Yeah, they were. Yeah, they wanted to keep this out of court, no public exposure on the surveillance program, so, uh, you know, concoct something about it. And they were doing that to us, too, and they tried three separate times to indict us, right? So at the same time, I was accumulating evidence of malicious prosecution on the part of the justice and also the FBI. When it came time to do that, I, you know, got the information to them uh, that I was preparing to, to charge them with malicious prosecution when they took, it, took us to court for this fabricated conspiracy charge they were manufacturing. So the NSA says that, of course, none of this data that you're talking about is used maliciously against American citizens. Talk uh, about why that's not true and also the parallel <clears throat> construction kind of yeah. retroactive <clears throat> framing of you know, how yeah, you can are, use they this. They're speaking when they say that. They're speaking for analysts in NSA. That's the only people they're speaking for. But they don't tell you that they left taps in for CIA and FBI and DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency. And they also didn't uh, tell anybody that the Five Eyes, uh, GCHQ and in Britain, uh, you know, Canadians, Australians and New Zealanders also had direct access to that database. This is the collection of bulk acquisition of data, all piled into the, I assume it's all basically in the uh, Utah, one million square foot storage facility. Uh, and they allow them direct access in to interrogate it, and that's all done without any oversight whatsoever. And, uh, you know, then they use it against uh, Jim Risen, Jim Rosen, the Associated Press, and... So they have already used this data to spy on whistle, activist groups and whistleblowers and, and groups like Occupy Wall Street. Yeah, right, and, and reporters of all sorts. So they're already using it, and the, yes. and the DA has access, all these other agencies have access, and, and also what you and Snowden have frequently talked about, which is the retroactive prosecutorial aspect right, of that's this. Right, uh, that's the next step. Once you've got the data and the access to it, you can search target people, for example, if you get a tip from the streets, you know, somebody's a dope dealer, you go into this data and look at everything that person's doing, you know, assemble, um, assemble evidence for prosecution, and you could say, go arrest this people, these people. So that's the way they originally arrest people. Then when it comes to going to a court, criminal court, they, they actually do the parallel construction, which means they use standard policing techniques to look for data that will uh, implicate them in a crime. And, uh, and it helps that they know where the data is, so. But they pretend that it's not from the NSA that they acquired it from. Right, they, they substitute that for the NSA data in a court of law and say, here's the evidence that we use to prosecute them or to arrest them. Uh, you know, it's basic perjury, okay, so. And this is policy of the Department of Justice of the United States. And they used the two-hop principle that uh, Obama thought was really the way to do it. We told him it wasn't. You needed to add some restrictions because it meant that, like, if I called Google, that's one hop. Or if I, you know, got an mm -hmm. email with Google, that's one hop. The next hop is Google out. Uh, that's to 1.5 billion people a day, roughly. So within a few days, you have virtually everybody in the network on. So you, that means you can spy on anybody. So NSA was happy with that. One, once NSA is happy, you know there's something wrong. <laughs> right? It's real simple. Bill, we didn't hear much about Vault 7 yeah. in the WikiLeaks revelation about Nobody that. Nobody wants and to the, talk about the that. The CIA spying apparatus, that potentially more unaccountable than the NSA. I mean, talk about how far-reaching well, that goes. Actually, I think uh, what they had in Vault 7 uh, was a uh, contribution from NSA and GCHQ and the other five eyes combined. Here's all our attacks. See what you can do with it. And they may have developed some of their own by, by actually capturing them from foreign countries. The ability, once you acquire it, to manipulate it, change it, and make it look like someone else is doing a hack or something like that. It was a set of programs that would allow them to make it look like the Russians did it or the Chinese. Right. Or the, you know, I mean, all those kinds of things are possible too. I mean, they could even uh, go in and attack your computer, look into your files and change and modify what you have there. Uh, so they can make it look like you're guilty of any crime. Before Snowden's revelations, before 9-11, Americans had a different mentality where we had the kind of memory of the Stasi Nazi Germany where you can ask people, oh God, I'd never support something like that, right? 
why this kind of mainstream complacency and kind uh, of the mantra now where I have nothing uh, to hide, so why should I have anything to fear? A great quote from Joseph Goebbels, uh, the propaganda minister for uh, Hitler. You know, so, I mean, those are great quotes. I mean, that's exactly how totalitarian states operate. That's the point. This is a totalitarian-based slide. This is where we're going. Uh, uh, you know, I think uh, they, they've done it by basically generating fear in the population. The fear that something's going to happen unless they do this. When in fact, I mean, we knew that was a, a, a fraud from the beginning. You don't have to give up any privacy to have security. Let's move on to the allegations uh, of Russian hacking into Podesta's email account in the DNC. Can you first go over the evidence that Mueller claims to have to prove that it's Russia? Well, you see, I, I really don't, uh, I don't know of any evidence that Mueller has because he never made it public. <laughs> so the only evidence I have is what's, what's made public. And from that, it went into the uh, Rosenstein indictment, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Gusser II and uh, DC leaks or DC leaks uh, data. And they talked about that as the evidence for the indictments and so on. Uh, you know, they claimed that the Gusser II was a Russian but the timestamps that we have on the programming inside the data that was published by Gusper 2 uh, shows a timestamps that are consistently inside the United States. But that's not the real issue. The real issue was with the data itself and how quickly it was downloaded. It was incompatible with the transfer across the net to anywhere uh, over any distance. If it went beyond the high-speed line that you had dedicated to you, then it's, it slowed down. And explain that in layman's terms, why you think this was an inside leak as opposed to a hack. Okay, well, the, the fastest download speed we had was a 49.1 megabyte rate, which meant that the hacker was taking the data out at that rate across the network, wherever they were. You know, they could be local, they could be anywhere. So we said, okay, well, what is the capacity of the lines going across to Europe? And at that point, everything failed, right? You couldn't get it across that fast but you could do a thumb drive or something local. Some of our people disagreed with that. They said they thought it could. So we said, okay, we're gonna try it. So, you know, got hacker friends in Europe trying to, and a friend in the US to put up a gigabyte of data and say, here, try to pull it across, see how fast you can get it. And the fastest they could get was from a data center in New Jersey to the UK in London. And that was 12.0 uh, megabytes per second, less than one fourth the necessary capacity to transmit the data alone. But what about the timestamps? Do you think that Russia could have been throwing off analysts by planting false timestamps? Uh, well, first of all, you have to understand the massive surveillance that's involved. Everything is captured so by NSA. So NSA should have some of that evidence somewhere. And they have failed to come forward. Even in the IC, the, Internet, inter, uh, inter, the intelligence community assessment that Russia hacked it, you know, uh, NSA had moderate confidence. Right, what does and that so mean? That means we have no evidence. Because the other intelligence agencies said they had confidence, but, but the they, NSA they said they had moderate confidence. But you see, they aren't relevant. When it comes to communication, NSA is the only one that matters. The rest of them don't. And did they explain what the moderate confidence that they had no, meant? No. I, I mean, to me, that's language for I have no evidence. So look, I, I wanted to get this out of the way because it's, it's always interested me. Because you claim that um, British diplomat Craig Murray corroborates this, that yep. he claims yep. that he handed over a drive to well, someone. Uh, he talked to somebody who was involved in transferring the data, yeah. So he, he himself talked to someone. But it, uh, even from the forensic evidence based on the WikiLeaks um, exposure of data that, that they published, there were multiple ways that they got it. And who else has corroborated your findings? Um, a number of uh, technical people, people in the veteran intelligence professionals for sanity and uh, others around, uh, around the world, by the way. Mm -hmm. You're not hesitant to call people in the U.S. government criminals, yep. co-conspirators. Are there any enforcement bodies that are still doing their job and following the Constitution at this point? Uh, actually, it's getting hard to find them. Even the Rutherford Institute, you know, looking at the application of law around the world, local and state people, uh, are seeing, you know, the, the idea that uh, they have scrapped the Fourth Amendment in terms of their arresting and, and searching people and things like that. What about the CIA? Should that agency be abolished? <laughs> Actually, I think they do perform a function that's meaningful to keep. But the rest of it, sure. There's a big chunk of it that should be eliminated. So for NSA also.
Yeah. Uh, you know, I think we can cut the intelligence budget, which is probably over a hundred billion dollars a year. You know, um, and they're really trying to defend us, but haven't fa have failed every time an attack occurs. As you mentioned, there's barely anyone in Congress that has. Uh, a different view on U.S. foreign policy, on curbing the surveillance state, curbing the police state. What is going on here? Why is no one able to see what we're seeing, Bill? Well, because we're not a members of the uh, uh, military intelligence complex or the shadow government. We're not members of that. So, you know, everybody in that environment is kind of, they're in their own bubble, okay? Everyone in Congress? Uh, a good many of them, yeah. You must, at all costs, protect the program. Because if you don't, we lose power control and eventually money. So I know that you said you don't link up to wireless networks and you know, surveillance technology, but what do you say to the audience who just feels completely disillusioned at this point, saying, look, we have to incorporate some of our lives online. What are they supposed to do? It's a, it's a matter of uh, don't put anything out there that you don't want someone else to read. But even speak at this point. That too, that too. Don't say anything you don't want anybody else to hear. That's a pretty yeah. stark reality, isn't it? Now, I say everything because I want them to hear, okay? <laughs> because I want them to know what I'm going to do in court. Yeah, but what about people who want to protect their privacy? Then you invent your own encryption and don't pass it through NIST because then they will have it. So you don't do that. You don't use anything publicly because they already got that. And the encryption methodologies that are available now were in, the NSA was involved in constructing themselves. Well, they, they also know the algorithms, all of them, they have the software for it because it has to run through NIST to do testing. They do the testing and then they approve it for public use. So I say, hey, if you're talking to your little community, make your own encryption. You don't care, you're not doing this publicly, we're just doing it by ourselves. So that would cause them a real problem.